Angeles. My family's been waiting so long already. They're getting impatient. We have a dog in there. We have to drive way back to, to the coast. I want to see that video. I want to see that video. This is ridiculous. I only shot what you told me I could shoot. The she wants to see the tape. I, want I to didn't see the shoot tape anything and I inside. Wanted rewound. I just shot I on the roof. I wanted rewound. I shot outside. I want you to open it and rewind this is ridiculous. it. ridiculous. Because this I want to see what is inside. Okay. Okay, this is like a legacy of paranoia that goes on and on. Well, sometimes we have to do these things. What's the big deal? What are I you so want to have paranoid it. about? Let what could see. I possibly hurt you? Okay, it's rewound. Outside. There's nothing inside that I shot. Are you sure? How much longer do we have to stay here? This is ridiculous. Okay, can we go now? You have no I right guess. to take our camera. I guess so. Okay. I guess yeah. I have nothing to, to hold you. Goodbye. Ugh. This is absolutely amazing. God, I can't believe this. Earlier in the afternoon, we had arrived at Organon, home of the Wilhelm Reich Foundation near Rangeley, Maine. We'd come in a rented van from our vacation spot on the East Coast. Not only had I been interested in Wilhelm Reich for some time, but I also had formulated an idea for doing a video based on the Oriner experiment, which had been carried on in the early 1950s at Morganon. We were greeted by a young docent. Okay, the tours take 30 minutes and it starts with a slideshow. Um, you can take as much videotape as you want on the grounds and from the roof, but there's none allowed in the building. Okay, okay follow thanks me. a lot. Even though I was disappointed that I wasn't going to be able to get any video inside of the Institute building, I kept shooting right up the steps until we got to the door of the Institute because I figured I mostly needed exterior shots anyway. I stopped recording while we took the tour, but once we got on the roof, at the encouragement of the docent, I started shooting video again. Then when we turned around to go back inside, I let the camera keep recording. Unfortunately, the docent noticed that the red light was on my camera. I acted embarrassed, turned it off, and left. My daughter stayed behind to use the restroom, and when she came back to the car, she told me about a conversation she had over. Madame Lung, oh, yes. there's a man, I was giving him a tour, and his camcorder light was on, and I think that he was, he's taking videotape in the museum. We were up on the roof, oh. and he was shooting, and then oh. when he came back in, his, his video recorder was still on. Oh. And so I told him, your recorder's on, and he said, oh, I wasn't aware of that, but... He didn't identify himself? Didn't he? No, he just, they, just, they came in for a tour, a family, they came in for a tour, and then... Um, yes, but he was not supposed to shoot. No, and I said, and there's no videotape taping in the museum, and you're not I supposed to... I think we should to, report it immediately to Mary. Please, would you kindly give me Mary? Mary. The young docent just reported that there's a man on the roof uh, with a videotape, and uh, she thinks that he's quite suspicious. I better give the telephone to her, and she will report to you what she saw. Miss Higgins, there's a man in the museum who's taking videotape. Yeah, I told him he wasn't supposed to, but, but he, his light was on and, and he said he didn't know, but I think he's just acting really suspicious and I think he's filming in the museum. Okay. Okay, we'll try. All right, thanks. Bye. She would be thanks. over, yes? She's coming right over and, yes. and we're just supposed to stall him until yes. Yes. she gets here. 
family. There's her mother, Eleanor, in the straw hat, and her Aunt Selma in the white hat. And there's her dad, Herb, walking up to Uncle Lenny. On the second day, Julie's friend Sadie came to pay us a visit. She was vacationing with her mother on the coast of Maine as well. She had never met Julie's grandparents, Herb and Ellie, before. Is that her husband? Yeah, and she's going to with us to see the Orgasm Museum. What? We're going to the Orgasm Museum tomorrow at Maine. No, really? Yeah. I'm not no, kidding. Really? really. It's called that? Yeah. Well, not really. Well, Oregon Museum. Well, <coughs> but it's about, it's about orgasms. It really means that. It means about orgasms. It's a museum about it, and we're going there. And my mom's letting my grandparents come. No. Yeah. That's a bad move. You need to ditch them. Tell them to take their own cars and drive. We're going we're gonna to drop them off at Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are at the Oregon Museum. Yeah. physicist knows that in sleep one often finds solutions to problems one has tried to solve in vain while awake. I myself, during twilight sleep, have worked out a whole series of functional equations. I do not mind admitting this because I'm not interested in the superiority of pure intellect over emotions. The human intellect is only the executive organ of the living plasma investigating and probing the world around us. It must be decided whether nature is an empty space with few widely scattered specks, or whether it is a space full of cosmic primordial energy, a continuum that functions dynamically and obeys a general valid law of nature. Neither weather formations nor tidal flow and ebb functions according to the laws of machines. The primitive view of emotional life was not mystical as is our view today, neither was it spiritualistic and or metaphysical, it was animistic. Nature was regarded as animated, but this animation was derived from man's own real sensations and experiences. The spirits had human form, the sun and the stars acted like real living people. The soul of the dead continued to live in real animals. The primitive animistic intellect did not change the world within or without. The only thing it did in contradiction to natural scientific philosophy was to ascribe real functions to real objects where they did not belong. It placed its own reality into an alien reality, that is, it projected. The primitive intellect reasoned very close to probability when it equated fertility of the earth with the fertility of female body, or when it regarded the rain-bearing cloud as being capable of perception. Primitive man animated nature according to its own sensations and function. He animated them, but he did not mysticize them as did his successor several hundred years later. The 
sexual embrace, if abstracted and reduced to its basic form, represents superimposition and the bioenergetic fusion of two organotic systems. It is involuntary bioenergetic action. Bioenergetic superimposition is closely linked with plasmatic excitation and sensations of current in two organotic systems. died in his sleep at the Federal Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania on November 3, 1957. Few people paid attention. His fellow inmates were temporarily kept waiting while a check was made to find the missing prisoner. The world as a whole scarcely noticed. True, Reich's earlier prominence as a psychoanalyst merited a brief milestone in Time magazine. Died, Wilhelm Reich, 60, once famed psychoanalyst, associate and follower of Sigmund Freud, founder of the Wilhelm Reich Foundation, lately better known for unorthodox sex and energy theories of a heart attack in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, where he was serving a two-year term for distributing his invention, the Orgone Energy Accumulator, in violation of the Food and Drug Act. A telephone booth-sized device which supposedly gathered energy from the atmosphere and could cure while the patient sat inside common colds, cancer, and impotence. Wright pleaded against being in prison, saying that if the sentence were carried out, it would inevitably deprive the United States and the world at large of his equations on space and negative gravity. These equations are carried only in my head, known to no one on this planet. This knowledge will go down with me maybe for millennia should mankind survive the present planetary DOR emergency. It would mean certain death in prison of a scientific pioneer at the hands of psychopathic persons. An FDA injunction stipulated that all of Wilhelm Reich's softcover publications be destroyed and that all hardcover publications be withdrawn from circulation. In 1933, the same year that his books were burned by the Nazis as Jewish pornography, he was also banned by the Berlin Communist Party and rejected by the Viennese psychoanalytic establishment. Libido is the energy of the sexual instinct. One day we may be able to measure. That's all right as a metaphor, but libido doesn't exist in the body. It isn't a material thing. The psychoanalytic movement serves only the rich people. How about everybody else? How is it possible to overcome sexual repression in the masses if one does not have a mass technique corresponding to the individual analytical technique? Perhaps a technique will emerge from the practice of sexual politics. Without positive sexuality, Hitler's diabolical manipulations of distorted sexuality will triumph. The liberty of the individual is not a benefit to culture. It is better for them to sublimate their sexual instincts. If they check their instincts, they become sick. If society produces neurotics by the millions, what help is the psychoanalyst couch? People need a reality principle to keep the pleasure principle in check. Otherwise, we'd have anarchy. The ruling class has a reality principle that only serves for the perpetuation of its own power. Your resolutions drag politics down into the gutter. You are a dangerous counter-revolutionary who wishes to make fornication organizations out of Marxist youth organizations. There are no orgasm disturbances in the proletariat, only in the bourgeoisie. The revolution in the cultural superstructure fails to take place because the psychic structure of human being has not changed. If you change the economic basis of society, human relationships will change by themselves. It is exactly the personal life of people which must be a basis for any revolutionary movement. We want 
genitally happy people, not emotional cripples who are going to do exactly what Stalin says. It is counter-revolutionary to expose working class youth to this trash. It will weaken their fighting spirit. And it is on this basis that the party has decided the following. All brochures by Wilhelm Reich, handled by the Literature Distribution Division, are to be withdrawn. Reich's brochures treat the issues in a manner contradictory to the revolutionary education of working class youth. Organ energy was discovered in a bion culture. The term bion refers to the vesicles into which all matter disintegrates if made to swell. These vesicles represent transition forms between non-living and living matter. The bion is the elemental functioning unit of all living matter, compounded of a membrane, a fluid content, and an amount of energy. I started as early as 1936 to autoclave bion preparations for half an hour at 120 degrees Celsius. Disintegration into vesicles turned out to be more complete than when I simply used the process of swelling. In 1939, one of my assistants took the wrong container from the sterilizer and instead of earth, she heated ocean sand to incandescence. After two days, a culture has started to form which shielded a yellow growth. Under microscope, this new kind of culture appeared as large packets of energy vesicles glimmering with an intense blue. The effect of these bions on rocked bacteria, protozoa, and T. bacilli was much more powerful than any other bions. Brought together with cancer cells, they killed or paralyzed the cells. This process was recorded on film. In late 1919, when I was about 22 and already a practicing analyst, Reich wrote his first published article. In this article, Reich wrote as though we were treating a patient who illustrated certain psychological mechanisms. However, there can be little doubt that the patient is Reich himself, especially since many years later, Reich told his elder daughter that the article was a self-analysis. In the report, Reich as an analyst writes that the patient broke off treatment after exactly four weeks. Reich then has the patient send the analyst a lengthy letter describing on paper what he could not say in person. The tutor began to court her. He arranged for pleasant drives and seemed to become bolder as he became aware of the situation at home, such as the outbreaks of jealousy between my parents, and also of the fact that she fancied him. I'm not quite sure how the affair began because I didn't notice anything. I first became conscious of the situation and began to keep track of it one afternoon when father was asleep and I saw my mother going into the tutor's room. they didn't seek and find an opportunity to be alone. Shortly after Christmas, father went away for three weeks. During that time, I had the most horrible and repulsive experiences imaginable, which buried themselves deep in my thought and emotions. father's absence, mother slept in the back room at the end of the hall, then came our room, the dining room, and the tutors. The very night, I hadn't shut an eye from excitement. I heard mother get out of bed and tiptoe past my bedroom and her nightgown. Soon I heard his door open and close partially. Slowly, I made my way to the door of his room. It was open. I stood there and listened. All the frightful memories that drag each recollection of my mother down into the dust that soiled my image of her with muck and filth. Probably I made some sound in my excitement.
All I remember of that catastrophic night is that I wanted to rush into the room, but was held back by the thought, they might kill you. I recalled having read that a lover will kill anyone who disturbs him. With a head full of bizarre fantasies, I crept back to bed without hope of consolation, my youthful spirit broken. Wright next summarizes the patient's report of the aftermath of the affair. The father apparently discovered it and the mother committed suicide by taking poison. Wright told other people some crucial details that were left out of the published case history. He explained to them that he himself had told his father. Wright at first only hinted of the affair. Sternly interrogating his son, the father was able to force the full story out of him. Leon then went to confront the mother. The study of protozoal development in grass infusions was not the only path to the investigation of transitional forms between the non-living and the living. About the same time we began our protozoal studies, I became curious about the transformation of food into energy. Anyone who observed us playing with food would only have dismissed us as crazy uh, this kind of childlike playing at the beginning of a research endeavor can be compared with the great discoveries of a young child. For our first experiment, we threw meat, potatoes, vegetables of all kind into a pot which we filled with water. We cooked the mixture for half an hour, took a sample and hurried with it to the microscope. When we put this mixture under the microscope, I thought we would be able to distinguish the different foods that comprised the brew. However, the preparation contained nothing but vesicles of different sizes but the same basic type. More significantly, when I observed the vesicles using higher magnifications over 2,000 times, I noted a motility within them, an inner expansion and contraction. I believe that these vesicles from foodstuffs are functionally identical with the vesicles observed in the grass infusions. They are both bions. The cosmic organ ocean is moving in an undulatory fashion and in a certain direction in our planetary system. Out of this undulating substratum, innumerable single concentrations of organ energy emerge. Both the organ energy ocean and the single organ energy units illuminate. The natural color of the general substratum is bluish gray or bluish green, sky, ocean, protoplasm, biomes, etc. That of the concentrated units is deep purple or violet. Gross streak-like concentrations appear whitish blue and are rapid in contradistinction to the other types of organ movement. If cosmic rays are functions of atmospheric organ energy, then they are not coming down on us from the universe, but are part and parcel of the energy envelope of the planet. It was necessary to study the radiation of bions by the least complicated means. For this purpose, an enclosed space had to be constructed that would contain and isolate the radiation emanating from the bions and prevent its rapid diffusion into the surroundings. Organic matter could not be used because it absorbed radiation. However, on the basis of my observations, I was certain that the matter would reflect the radiation and hold it within the enclosed space. But the radiation could also penetrate the metal and disperse outward. To prevent this, the apparatus had to be walled with metal on the inside and with organic matter on the outside. The radiation generated by the cultures on the inside would be reflected by the inner metal walls, by the outer surface of organic matter, cotton and wood would prevent or at least reduce the disbursement of the radiation to the outside. The wall of the apparatus was to have an opening to enable the radiation to be observed from the outside. I'm accustomed to sitting in the organ metal room for about two hours. After that period, the organ energy becomes so excited that I must leave the room. 
The first evening, when the Geiger counter was in the organ room, I had to interrupt the observations after only 20 minutes. The air was very heavy. The pressure, as we are accustomed to call the perception of concentrated organ energy, was unbearable. The motion of blue-gray illuminating clouds was much faster than usual. The severe Oranu reaction is comprehensible only in the light of these preliminary observations. Oh, 